When I, an awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. Shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration. Well, good morning, church family. Good to see you. If you're outside in the foyer, if you want to make your way inside, and will you stand with us? <laughs> I know you just got comfortable. You stand with us, and uh, I'm going to read Psalm 98 as our call to worship this morning. It says this, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. So let's sing and let's rejoice to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning. Come and stand before your Maker, full of wonder, full of fear. Behold his power and glory, yeah, with confidence drawn near. For the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the God who stands to bless us with an unrelenting love. We go, come and lift your hands and praise your voice. He is worthy of our grace. Bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know 
the affections of a father who will have nothing will rejoice. Come and lift your hands and pray your voice. He is worthy of our grace. Rejoice. See your mercy suffer me and with carried up the hill he has walked this path before us he is walking with us still turning tragedy to triumph turning agony to grace there is blessing in the battle they take part in stand amaze rejoice when you cry and many hears your voice your tears rejoice in the midst of suffering we will help you see rejoice come and lift your hands and raise your voice he is worthy of our grace rejoice see the mercies of your King.
16, it says this. I'm going to read this out loud. It says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. So we just sang that song, saying about how great our God is, and yet we have to ask, how do we come before this great God, right? Because we know our hearts from this past week and just life. How is it? It's through Jesus Christ, our great high priest. And so we're going to sing about that now as we sing before the throne of God above.
I know my heart from this past week. And even though we can stand before God because of our high priest, Jesus Christ, I know that I've broken God's law this week. And so I'm just going to silently give us a chance to confess that sin to God. So just take a minute and you can pray silently. stand here right now. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, for wiping away our sin as far as the east is from the west. God, for making us new creations, for saying it is finished, for paying it in full. So God, we're humbled and thankful by that mercy that you've had towards us. So we can stand here forgiven. So thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Colossians 1, 21 and 22 says this, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. And through Jesus Christ and him alone, we're forgiven, we're holy, we're blameless, and so now we're going to sing about that mercy that we've received.
you've done for us through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for your mercy that's boundless. It's bigger than our minds can comprehend because we know how we treat each other. And if somebody hurts us or wrongs us, how quickly we want to get back at them and get vengeance. And yet, God, towards us, that's not your heart. And so thank you for that grace and mercy. We ask that you would speak to us now through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Thank you. Good. As my friend Tony Souter, the elder, likes to say, we're better together. And so I'm glad you're here this morning because we're better with you here worshiping with us. If you would take a moment and pull out the Karen connection cards on the seat back in front of you, love to have you fill that out and let us know how we can be praying for you and with you. We will be praying tomorrow at our staff meeting as we do every week, and it's our joy and our privilege to take those requests before the Lord. You can also do your prayer requests on the Church Center app. You can check on what's going on in the life of the church there, and you can do all sorts of good things. So whether Karen Connection Card or Church Center app, please let us know that you're here. Please just let us know how we can be an encouragement to you in the days ahead, and those cards can go in the black boxes at the back with your tithes and offerings this morning. I want to draw your attention to one announcement in the bulletin, and that's the one at the top. Our monthly men's breakfast is meeting this Saturday the 4th at 7 a.m. in the multi-purpose room. As always, we're going to have warm breakfast, warm fellowship, and good teaching, and we'd love to have you join us for that, and we'd love to have you register online so we can make sure we have enough food for everybody. So men, please come join us on Saturday, and for the rest of you, there are lots of things going on in the life of the church. Well, for the past two weeks, we have been talking about missionaries in our church and focused on missions. We've been focusing each week on one of the five missionaries that we as a church support. And today, we are going to be focusing on the Milhomen family. Each week, we do this to take the time to pray for them, to invite your financial support for their ministry, and to join us in thanking God for what they're doing in your bulletin is an insert that tells you about the Milhomen family and their three children. They have a, a very interesting ministry and a very fruitful ministry among the poor in South Africa. They work through sports events, through classes, through gospel proclamation and training to create opportunities for both kids and adults who are impoverished in South Africa. One of the things that they are truly focused on these days is raising up new leaders, in fact, raising up leaders from within the South African culture uh, who are familiar with the language and the culture there to minister to their own. And so that is one of the things that we're going to be praying for them today and in the week ahead. And again, I encourage you to keep these inserts with you so that you can be praying for this family and the others as we focus on them today and for the next two weeks. I want to focus on another aspect of our Gather, Grow, Give, and Go, which has to do with our own missions team that's heading for El Salvador at the end of this week. So team, would you come on up? This is the 10th year in a row that we have sent a team down to El Salvador to be as part of what is called The Gathering, a ministry that was conceived by Mike and Brittany Peterson here in the church and that cares for missionaries and their families in South America and in El Salvador in particular. So I'm going to ask Pastor Tony to tell you a little bit more about what our team is going to be doing as they go down there this week. So this is, uh, this is 10 years. Mike and Brittany Peterson, when they went uh, to El Salvador to be missionaries, they went with the mindset that they wanted to serve other missionaries, that they wanted to come alongside, help them find rest, find respite, um, that they wanted to help them think through the, you know, minutiae of life and how to best um, handle them. Because for a lot of missionaries, like they go and, hey, I want to serve the Lord and I've got this mindset of how I'm going to do that. And then a lot of the other pieces of life start entangling them and take away lots of opportunity and time. And so uh, Mike, having a real good skill with how to travel and things, um, wanted to kind of go and say, hey, I can use my gift to help you handle life so that you can then just focus on giving the gospel and helping people grow in Christ to the missionaries. And so they've been doing that for a long time. The first few years that we were there, we found out that um, not only did the missionaries like need help with just those basic things of just, hey, how do I keep 
other things moving in my life within the country. But they didn't know other missionaries were around them. And uh, we found out there, there were some that were in San Salvador, the main city, that were even just a few blocks away from each other. And they never knew there was other missionaries right there. And so um, this gathering allowed them to start knowing who else was around and how they could you know, fellowship with one another, how they could help serve one another. Um, and so the way that we go down and serve them in this uh, retreat is that we provide child care and youth ministry care, and then we also help uh, lead the worship that goes on there. And the reason that's important is uh, in the area that they're in, there's been a lot of sexual abuse. There's a lot of just hurt and pain that's caused physically and emotionally. And so families are very guarded with their kids. They, it's, it's pretty much they got to live with each other 24-7. Um, as they go and serve there. And, and so anybody who's kind of parented for a while, if you know you've got your kids all the time, constantly, like it makes it hard for you to find real rest and find respite. And so that's our goal is to go down and provide that for them, a safe place for their families, a safe place for their kids to play with each other, an opportunity for them to gather and to enjoy one another's company, but also then be encouraged through God's word and to then fellowship with one another, know how to pray for each other as they go. So that's our goal as we go down. Um, when we go down, we raise money to go and serve them. And uh, if you would like to help us, because part of our raising money is not only to raise money for the team here, but to raise money for the missionaries. Because as a missionary, as you go and serve, um, many times it's hard for them to say, hey, you know, you've given me money to help be, be on the field, but could you give me a little bit more money to go to this retreat and go on like this, like it sounds like a vacation. And uh, so sometimes like, it feels awkward for them to have to ask or it's hard for them to ask for that. And so we do the best as we can to raise some extra funds that we can help provide for them because we've got people coming from Guatemala and Honduras to help make sure that they're able to come so that they can be cared for, they can be encouraged, so they can then go out and serve the Lord a little bit more each year. Thanks, Tony. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for stirring the hearts of these faithful people to go and minister in your name. How beautiful is the gospel message of these who bring good news, news of happiness, of salvation, of hope in Jesus Christ. We ask that you would bless the work of this team and give them safe travel to and from El Salvador. Please let them experience uncommon joy and unity as they minister to the missionary families in El Salvador. And let those families be blessed and encouraged by their time at the gathering. Father, we also ask for your blessing upon Lika and Mario and their ministry to the poor in South Africa. Strengthen them. Establish the work of their hands. Father, they're asking specifically that you would help them train local leaders to expand their ministry. They're asking that you would provide them with a minibus for their transportation needs. They're asking that you would protect them from sickness, from gang violence, and that you would help their kids grow up loving and serving Jesus. Please use our prayers and our financial gifts to spread gospel hope through their ministry as you build your church throughout the world. Now, Father, please prepare our minds to receive the preaching of your word to us this morning and give us grateful hearts, we ask, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, kids up through grade five, you can head toward the back and meet your teachers. Youth, you can head to your program in classroom six. And with the rest of you, please stand and greet one another.
church family, if you guys will all remain standing for the reading of the word. Today's passage comes from Ephesians 4, verses 7 through 16. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, be led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is the reading of the word. You may be seated. Amen. Thanks, Elaine. Well, good morning, church family. Hopefully later on today you'll find a place that's warm and cozy because it is going to be wet and cold. Um, speaking of wet and cold, uh, Christmas this year was fun in the Wajniki home for a lot of different reasons. One of the reasons was because for our youngest... We got her as one of her presents this year, a remote control car. Now, whether or not this gift was really for Claire or for me, it's yet to be seen. But nonetheless, she she got the gift, and she really enjoyed it. Well, that was actually a few days later, because when we opened up the gift, like any remote control car, you have to put either either in batteries or you got to charge the batteries. And so we did that for her car, got the batteries all charged up, turned on the car, then turned on the remote control and started it up, began to use it. What happened, though, was that the rear tires spun and moved the car forwards and backwards, but the front wheels wouldn't turn side to side. So the car only went in one direction, forwards or backwards, it couldn't turn. Now, while it was fun to see how fast it would go, nonetheless, you want a car that ultimately can move and and maneuver. And so I knew something was wrong, And I was like, oh, no, like, should I send this back? You know, should we go through that whole rigmarole? I'm like, let me just open up the car and see if I can (laughs) fix it. You know, we did it the first hour, too. Doubted my capabilities in opening up the car. And you'll be surprised it it worked out, but part of what you're thinking about me actually did happen. So here's what happened. I opened up the, the front of the vehicle. I had these little tools, and sure enough, I saw that the motor that controls the steering system in the front of the car just one wire was not soldered on properly, so it was disconnected. So the, <clears throat> the batteries weren't communicating to the motor to, to turn the car. So I'm like, ah, I, you know, I could do that. I, I, I soldered it, went, went well. But the, the container, if you will, the little uh, compartment that held the motor also held all the gears that turned the wheels. And when I went to set it down, I, I just kind of bumped it a little bit. And those gears that were all set in there were just that, set in there. And they spit out of the compartment. Now, I hadn't paid any attention to how those gears fit together. And when they went off on the table, I just thought to myself, oh, no. Like, I got the motor working, but the gears, now I got to figure out how to put them all back together. And what would have been just a 15-minute project turned into a two-hour puzzle piece for me. Why? Because those gears all have to be placed in the right way. They're all absolutely necessary for the remote control car to be able to function. And so with God's grace, I was able to get it back in, and I got the car working, and so there was much joy in the home as the car was able to to drive. But I thought about that a lot because the remote control car was a great gift, 
But it wasn't something that could be fully enjoyed unless all the parts of the car were working properly. I also began to realize how important having those different gears put in the correct order in the car, how necessary they were. Literally, more than once, I was just off with one gear in the wrong position. I mean, just off just a little bit, and it just wouldn't turn. But once it was put back, I saw the importance of each one of those gears. And I share this with you because in our passage today, in Ephesians chapter 4, you're not just supposed to play favorites with the Word of God. Like, I love teaching all of, of God's Word. But there's passages that we're coming to like this one that are just so foundational and important for us as believers and as a church. Without a passage like this and rightfully understanding it and applying it in our lives, we can miss out on, on so much joy. Like we can have this thing called the church because this is a passage really about the church. It's about how the church is to function and, and the place that you play and that I play in the church. And if we actually capture this message, if we really see how God has ordered things, and if we don't get things out of order, there is so much joy to be experienced and so much glory to be given to God. And so I really feel like this is a passage that's so necessary, not just for our church, but for every church that calls upon the name of the Lord. So I want to invite you this morning to open up in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 7 through 16 this morning. And, and as you turn there, you need to know a little bit of the, again, the context of this passage. Church, this is a set of verses really for believers. It's for those who have been saved, redeemed, who have encountered the grace of Jesus Christ, been brought from death to life. Like, because this passage is God speaking to his people. So I just want us to be clear on, on that. It's, it's for the church, and it's for people who understand what Paul has said before this, how Paul has spoken in chapters 1 through 3 about the glorious doctrines and theology of who Jesus Christ is, how we come to faith, what he has given to us, who he has made us. In fact, if you don't know what he's done for us, who he has made us, and what we now have, how, how ultimately, because of what we have received and who we are, we are to, to live in a certain way, then, then you will not fully understand the emphasis and the call of this passage. But let me just tell you overall the main idea of this passage. And then the rest of the message is going to be me teasing it out. Now, it's not in your notes. You can write this down. But when you come to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 16, as we heard read, here's what God's word is coming to us and saying. It comes to us and proclaims that God gives every Christian spiritual gifts. And he gives Christians as gifts to his church so that the church grows spiritually and numerically. Not that point. You can take that one off the screen. We're not there yet. <clears throat> the main point of this passage is that God gives every Christian spiritual gifts and gives Christians as gifts to his church so that the church grows spiritually and numerically. It's what, it's what God wants us to hear and to receive. Because in the passage right before this, Paul has talked about how through Jesus Christ, there's this unity that's produced within the church, but don't confuse unity with uniformity. And what I mean by that is, while we're to be unified, there are differences amongst us, differences that God gives, and those differences in the form of these spiritual gifts are for our help. So when you come to this passage, look with me at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. We're just going to start with verse 7. Paul says, but grace was given to each one of us, and the us in that passage are believers in Jesus Christ, the people who he's been talking to, the, the saints of the Lord, those who have been redeemed. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. So what's been given to us? He says grace has been given to us. And what is grace? We've been talking about grace. It's come up already in the book of Ephesians. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is ultimately receiving that which you do not deserve and you did not earn. 
And up to this point, whenever Paul's talked about grace, he's been talking about the grace and the gift of grace that is your salvation and my salvation. For by grace you have been what? Saved. It's God's gift to you, and it's God's gift to me. We didn't earn our salvation. We didn't merit our salvation. But God did something for you. He gave you salvation through Jesus Christ. Well, now he's going to use grace to refer to something else. That is this measure of Christ's gift that we all receive. But grace was given to you in accordance with the measure of, of Christ's gifts. What is this gift that we have received? Well, here, Paul is talking about spiritual gifts, and what he's wanting us to know in verse 7 is that every Christian, now for your first point, every Christian is given spiritual gifts by God. That's the very first point of this message, of this set of verses. Paul is saying every Christian, and when I mean every, I mean every, has been given spiritual gifts by God. That's the grace that we have received. Why do we know that that's what he's talking about? Well, because of how we use these gifts later on, he's going to talk about that. But also because Paul addresses this in greater detail in some other passages. When he writes to the church in Rome, he writes this. Look at Romans 12, 4 through 6. You can write this down, but it's going to be up on the screen. You can look in your Bible. He says this. For as in one body we have many members. Well, we've heard that. That's familiar. He's talked about that even here in the book of Ephesians. And the members do not all have the same function so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. These things we've already heard in Ephesians. Like if you're a Christian, you're brought into this thing called the church. and It is Christ's body. There's no individuals who are disconnected within the body of Christ. We are connected to one another. And then he says this, verse 6, having gifts that diff according to the grace given to us. So there he is. He's talking about the measure of Christ's gift. In Ephesians, he's talking again about the gifts that are given to us by grace. And he says, let us use them if, if prophecy in proportion to our faith. And he goes on and he lists all these other gifts. Church, the first thing that you need to know about yourself and myself is that God, our Father, gives every Christian these things called spiritual gifts. And it's an act of his grace that you're given these gifts. And in fact, Peter's not the only one, or Paul's not the only one. Peter also talks about it in 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11. I'm going to look here at verse 10. As each has received a what, church? A gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Do you see it? There it is again. Once again, by God's grace, this gift that he gives that you don't deserve I don't deserve, that we didn't earn, God gives you these gifts to be used in the life of the church. Every Christian is given spiritual gifts by God. If you are in Jesus Christ this morning, know this about yourself and the person sitting next to you. God has given you spiritual gifts. You are not simply the recipient of forgiveness. I mean, how glorious is that? You're not just a recipient of God's love that never goes away. How glorious is that? You're not just the recipients of immeasurable and unsearchable riches in Christ. How glorious is that? He additionally gives you and I these things called spiritual gifts. Now, a lot of people sometimes wonder, well, what, what are these spiritual gifts? I mean, we're recipients of this, but what is this gift that I have received? Because many times... You know, I think a lot of Christians, they don't know just the magnitude of what it is that Christ is giving to us here. It's like when I was that little kid, as I talked about during Christmas one year, and I was, said I received that gift from my aunt that was, a, that was a savings bond, you know, that accrues value over time. And I opened up that card as a five-year-old, and, and there was this piece of paper that said in 20 years it would be worth $50. And I was like, what is this? Right? I understand its value and its worth. Well, I don't want us to, to lose sight of how wonderful these spiritual gifts are. So what are they? There are three passages in God's Word that talk extensively about spiritual gifts. 1 Peter 4, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. And all of them are in harmony and say the same thing. And to summarize it, here's what spiritual gifts are. Abilities that are given by God to Christians, 
to Christians. These are abilities given by God to Christians for the purpose of serving and edifying other believers. So God gives to Christians these abilities, these supernatural abilities. And when you hear me say supernatural, I'm saying it's because they come from God. It's not going to give you the ability to like lift a car over your head or something like that, right? That's not the supernatural abilities. They're, they're things that God gives, abilities that he gives to you for a specific purpose. Not to make much of yourself, not for the praise and glory of your name, but to pour into the lives of other believers to care for and edify them. Those are what spiritual gifts are. In, in fact, we see Paul say, or Peter say this in 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11. We're going to see Paul talk about it in our passage a little bit later. 1 Peter 4, 10 says, as we saw earlier, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as stewards of God's varied grace. What are we to use these gifts for? To do what? Serve one another. They come from God to be used for others. And then this beautiful passage in 1 Corinthians 12, 7. To each is given a manifestation of the Spirit. When you read it in its context, he's talking about these spiritual gifts. For the common good. For the common good. So God gives these gifts. And, and here's the thing with spiritual gifts. They're different than innate talents or abilities that you and I might have. Some people are just really gifted with detail. And then they're just really good with detail. They're gifted with, with numbers and administration. Some people are really good artistically, creatively, musically. They just have these gifts and abilities. Some people are just really good communicators. Some people are just naturally compassionate. And so we have just natural abilities as those who are created in God's image. But believers and unbelievers are both given those things. It's just the way God makes us and the way God shapes us. Spiritual gifts are different. They're given by God for the purpose of being used to serve and to edify other believers. And let me say it again. How many Christians get spiritual gifts? Oh, okay, it wasn't a trick question. Let's get it all together now. How many Christians get spiritual gifts? Oh, there's not one person who's in Christ who does not receive this. He says, each of us receives this grace. And when you look at 1 Peter 4, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, specifically in 1 Peter 4, you see that Peter says that the spiritual gifts fall into one of two categories. Remember, they're used to serve, to edify. And so you see speaking gifts and you see serving gifts. Peter says it this way. Whoever speaks, verse 11, as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Christ. So there are these speaking gifts and then there are serving gifts. And wouldn't you know it that when you look at Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, guess what? Paul, when he enumerates the gifts and he talks about what these different gifts look like, they fall into one of those two categories. So, so you have the gift of like prophecy, the gift of teaching, the gift of exhortation. These are these speaking gifts. You have the gift of utterance of wisdom, the utterance of knowledge. So you have these gifts of God giving people the ability to use speech to serve through teaching and building up and to serve through speaking in such a way that encourages and builds up. And then you have these serving gifts. Literally, there's the gift of the act of service, the gift of generosity, the gift of leadership, the gift of acts of mercy, the gift of healing. And he goes on, the gift of helping, of administrating. And so not just using our words to build up and bless others, but actually using our physical selves, our time, and our capacity as a way of helping Christians in the church. Speaking gifts and serving gifts. Abilities given by God to Christians for the benefit of one another. These are what the spiritual gifts are. Now, some people will come and they will say, so, so what ultimately is my spiritual gift? <laughs> What's my spiritual gift? Let me just tell you. The answer to that question is, God knows. God knows what your spiritual gift is because who gives them? He does. A lot of people have assumptions about gifts. 
I've been in the church literally all my life. I've been a part of different churches. I've heard a lot of crazy messages and things about spiritual gifts, people making a lot of assumptions about gifts. God's word, I just, when I talk on spiritual gifts, I say, let's just say what God's word says. They come from God, and they are given. And when you get a spiritual gift, there's no scripture passage that says when you have a spiritual gift, you have it for the rest of your life. You always have spiritual gifts, but spiritual gifts aren't something that he only gives to you, and he only gives this one to you, and he only gives that one to you. Instead, spiritual gifts come to people from God for the benefit at any one given time of blessing and helping others. I have heard people who couldn't literally string two words together in a public setting stand up and give their testimony that had far more impact and power than the preacher who came after them. What was happening there? That was God giving them the ability to to speak and to exhort in that moment. I've seen people with a strength that God provides coming alongside and doing acts of service when they said, "I've, I've never done anything like that in my life to help others. People who've actually like, like gone down on this El Salvador trip who said, you know what, I could never minister to kids in that way. And yet they say, but I feel God's leading me to do this. And they went down and they helped and kids were blessed because they were there just loving on them. Listen, whatever we're gonna say about spiritual gifts, they're given by God to his people. And when somebody says, I have this gift and I have that gift, you can't claim the gift as your own because who gives it to you? God gives it. And so you say, well, how do I know what my spiritual gift is? You know what the answer to that is? Start serving and God reveals it. Start making yourself available to the things that God would call you to do in ministry to other people. Somebody comes to you and they say, hey, would you be willing to share your testimony? Seize that opportunity. You've been given this, the spirit of God, and who knows how God might use your testimony. When you see an opportunity to serve and you feel led to do that, pursue service. That's the way that we discover, and God uses us in other people's lives. It's a way that God is glorified because a lot of us have natural talents in different ways, and we can use those to the glory of God, and we should. But when it comes to how the spirit will work in your life and in my life to bless others, All that God calls us to do is to be available and to trust that when we serve, he will, as Peter says, provide the strength for us. It's a beautiful thing, but he is the one who gives the gifts. In fact, one of the things that the text is clear on, and this is little, there's this like funky little passage here. It tells us that Christ gives the spiritual gifts. Did you see that in the text? Did you see how Paul goes out of his way to to say that? But The grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. And then he goes in and he quotes this passage. I want to read it to you, and I want to say why it's so significant. He quotes from Psalm 68, where he says, Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended, that is Jesus, is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fulfill all things. What's going on here? What, why does Paul quote this passage from Psalm 68 that was originally used to, dis, to display how God went down and redeemed Israel from Egypt And now he takes it and he applies it to Jesus Christ. Well, because Paul, inspired by God, understood that that little psalm was actually pointing forward to declaring that it was Jesus Christ who descended from heaven and came to the lower regions of the earth. That is, he actually took on flesh. And he came down and what did he do? He did something. He did something that when he was done with whatever he did, He became the victor because then he ascended and he brought back with him these these gifts. Paul is saying to us that when Christ came down, lived, and then he died, he won something. He won a victory. And as a result of that victory, the fruit of that victory is, guess what? His giving to the church and individuals like you and me spiritual gifts. Paul is telling us here, this is huge, church. Listen very, very carefully to me. 
the fact that you and I are given spiritual gifts by God, that is a display and a testimony of his victory over the grave. Have you ever considered that your reception and my reception of spiritual gifts, you're using your spiritual gifts when you see them on display in other people, when you use your gift and it's affirmed, that's actually God's way of saying, can't you see? I conquered sin and death and hell, and today you are living this new life and using these gifts because I won the victory. You know, this idea of the spoils of war is not something that you and I are all that familiar with, but we see it. We see it today, and it's still displayed in sports. At the end of every season, you have the championship game, and what does a sports team win when they win a championship? Anybody want to say? When you win a championship, what do you receive? A trophy! Look, these are some of the major sports trophies that are won. Now, baseball, football, hockey, and basketball. And do you know why we give those who win the championship trophies? Because it is a physical, tangible display that we are the champions. And the teams put those on display, and the cities put them on display because they want people to know our team won. What this passage is telling us is that when you and I look out and see people in the body using their spiritual gifts, Paul is saying, don't you know what that means? Don't you know what that's? A, that is a trophy. That's his display of Christ's victory over the grave. It's a display to say Christ is one and he is reigning because we are the display of his glory. I mean, this has really changed so much my thinking. When I see you putting into acts of service, speaking into one another's lives, that is God showing to me and to the world the resurrection's true. I conquered the grave because you are able to serve and to minister to each other in that way. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about when your spouse goes out of his or her way to do an act of service for you or for the family to say, thank you for being a testimony of God's glorious resurrection from the dead? <laughs> They'd be like, what are you talking about? You couldn't have done that if he hadn't risen from the dead. <laughs> When we see these things on display, we're to celebrate this. Spiritual gifts are the fruit of Christ's victorious resurrection. I love this church. And guess what? As I said ever, earlier, every Christian is given spiritual gifts by God. But then the text goes on. It's not just saying that every Christian gets these spiritual gifts. It goes further than that. Look at what the passage says starting in verse 11. There's something else that... God gives to the church, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. Not only, church family, are you and I given spiritual gifts as God's people, but as we see here, People are given as gifts to the church. In fact, in your notes here, this is the next point. Every church, every church is given by God people who help the church fulfill its mission. That's what he's talking about here. He's saying he gives the spiritual gifts to everybody, but then he also gives these people who function in these Roles, and it's very clear that they function in these roles to help the church fulfill its mission. Just look at what he says here in verse 12. In verse 12, it says that he gives these people, and we're going to talk about who they are in just a second, but it says that he gives these people in these roles to equip the saints. And now, let me pause there. Who are the saints? Are the saints just the really holy people in the church, the people that are more righteous? 
Maybe you're like, yeah, that's me. That's me. That guy over there, not a saint. Who are the saints, church, according to the book of Ephesus and according to God's word? Who are the saints? All of us. You're sitting next to a saint. If they're in Jesus Christ, you are a holy one. There's, there's not a gradation here within the Christian faith. We are all saints. So look at the verse again, verse 12. He gives these people to his church to equip the saints, that is you and I, for what? For the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. God gives gifts in the form of people to his church to equip, to equip you and me and who's called to do the work of the ministry? According to that verse, who does the work of the ministry? The saints, we all do. But he gives to the church these specific people to equip them. And so to equip here literally means to provide what is needed for the mission. To provide what is needed for the mission. That's what it means to equip. I think the best way that I can illustrate this is through an analogy of, of using a Navy SEAL team. You know our Navy SEALs, right? They serve in our military. And within every Navy SEAL team, they're given a mission that they're called to accomplish. And every SEAL team has a leader. It has a captain. It has someone who is ultimately responsible for that team. And what they're responsible for is knowing the mission and knowing what the rest of the team needs to fulfill the mission. So they make sure that they have the right ammunition. They make sure that they have the right equipment packages Like if they're going to be doing a mission that involves them, you know, swimming in the water, the guy's not going to equip them with, you know, Arctic gear, right? He's going to equip them with the scuba gear that they need. And so that's that's the role of this member of the team. But notice what I just said. He is a member of the, the team. But he's there to lead, to make sure that they're equipped to fulfill the mission. But who ultimately does the mission? The whole team does it. The leader doesn't just do it by himself. He equips everybody else so that they can go out and they can fulfill this mission. And so that's what we see happening here. God says, I give to the church these people that that help equip the people of the church to fulfill the mission. But that bears a question. I just got to answer it really quickly. Church, what is the purpose of the church? What is the mission of the church? Because you might buy into the idea that there are people that are called to equip us and to help us fulfill the mission, but to what end? It's really interesting that here and in the rest of the Bible, the mission is pretty clear. In fact, some people think about the church and they think the aim of the church is activism, like we need to help the poor and the hungry. That's the purpose of the church. Some people think that the purpose of the church is just purely evangelism, go into the world and proclaim the gospel, like we just got to share the gospel with the lost. Absolutely, that's part of what the church does. And the church is supposed to care for those who are sick. Some people think that the purpose of the church is to help hurting, broken people. All those things are good, and all those things is what the church engages in. But the chief purpose of the church is, as we say, ultimately to glorify God by being and making disciples. As this passage goes on to make abundantly clear, God's chief purpose for the church is that it might become full-grown, and then when I say full-grown, I'm talking about spiritually mature, numerically that it would grow, and that each of its members, each of its members would contribute to helping the church grow into full maturity. The purpose of the church is not to be an institution and a place that's engaged just purely in activism. It's not just a place that ultimately pours out and feeds people. The church, by its very design and God's plan, is to be a place that helps others engage in the work of the ministry, that helps others grow and become equipped to make much of God in the world, to help one another, as we saw in the first part of this passage, to walk in a manner worthy. And if you think that the church is here for some other reason, then you're going to miss out on the joy and and you're going to not see why the church engages in the things that it engages in. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And what Paul does is, is he says, listen, you know that God has given people to help you to do that. And so he lists four different people. First, he says, God has given to the church apostles. That's the first people on the list. 
Because he's given to the church the apostles. And who were the apostles? Well, we know that they were those who were first sent out by Jesus to establish the church. The disciples were part of that apostolic ministry. Paul was part of that apostolic ministry. The apostles were the first who were sent by Jesus to establish the church. And then the second group they mentioned were the prophets. Now, who were the prophets? He's not talking about the gift of prophecy here. He's talking about the role of a prophet. In the Old Testament, the prophets were there to speak to Israel the word of God. In the New Testament, there were, in fact, prophets who, again, spoke the words of Jesus to the church. Because as God was forming the New Testament canon, which we would come to know today as God's word, there were those who were sent out to proclaim the message to the church in those first years. Ultimately, we have the scriptures. And so we believe that both the role of apostle and prophet are not roles that exist within the life of the church today, that they were necessary for the founding of the church The gift of prophecy is something else, and that's a different message. But he gave the apostles and the prophets, but then he also gave the evangelists. And who are the evangelists? Well, this is a role that still exists, and it's those who go out into the world proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Evangelists today still take on the form of what we would call even our missionaries, those who go to the ends of the earth, who have a specific calling to make Christ known in those places where he's not known. Man, I didn't say this in the first hour. I wish I would have. Because, you know, the word evangelist, it wasn't just a Christian word. Because back in that day, an evangelist was somebody who who made a proclamation. And in Paul's day, when a king conquered a territory, often they would conquer a city. But that city represented a much larger territory. And the villagers and the people far out, sometimes hundreds of miles away, were part of that kingdom. And all the city had been captured, they wouldn't know that a new king was in town. So you know what they would do? They would send out evangelists who would go out to the far reaches and they would say, new king in town, folks. There's a new king in town. Do you know that today we are called to engage in evangelism because Christ is on his throne. You know that. He is the king today. Can I get an amen to that? Like, he is reigning today. And one day, every knee, that's why the passage says, one day, every knee will bow. Every knee should bow right now. And and sometimes we say, would you make Jesus Christ your king today? No, 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 no. You don't make Jesus Christ your king. (laughs) That's not how we should talk about it. Will you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your king today? Because he is king. And so evangelists still exist. But then he comes to this last group that is engaged in helping in, in the church, and it's the shepherds and the teachers. And the why, reason why I say that that's, that's one group of people is because when you look at the, the Greek, it talks about the evangelists, the prophets, the apostles, but then it says the shepherds and teachers. The one Greek article covers both words, and so it's, it's to be viewed as one kind of office, one role. And what do these people do? Those who minister to local churches through teaching and care. So to this day, Paul comes and he says, listen, I have given as gifts to the church people who fulfill these roles to shepherd, to care for, and ultimately, as it says here, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. These people do not do the work by themselves, but the whole purpose of God giving you spiritual gifts And then giving to the church these people who help us is so that these people would help us use our gifts to make much of Christ and to build up the body. I had a conversation with somebody recently who was sharing with me that there was somebody in their life who came to them and said, you know, I don't go to church. In fact, I don't really need the church in my life. If I have the Bible and I have the Holy Spirit, that's all that I need. The Bible and the Holy Spirit is all any true Christian really needs. To which I say, which Bible are you reading? (laughs) Because this Bible says that God gives as a gift people to do what for us? Equip us in knowledge of his word and application of his word. It's literally right there. 
So if anybody ever comes to you and says, I don't need anybody else instructing me or speaking into my life, then they're not reading what it says here. And in a billion other places in the New Testament, the importance of allowing others to speak into our lives and, and instruct us. Listen, if God has to give the gift of people to the church to equip the saints, do you know what that means? We're not naturally equipped. We don't come into the Christian life fully formed. We don't come fully understanding the word of God. We need to grow in it, and we need others who help us. Listen, I'm including myself, and, and I serve as an elder and a pastor here, but I'm not the elder. I'm not the pastor. I need people who speak into my life and who speak into our lives. And so as we come to the word of God here, what we're saying is this. God gives people as gifts to help us in that. Now, I don't know about you, but if God gives me a gift, I sure don't want to reject it. <laughs> because one of the gifts that he gives is salvation. I don't see anybody rejecting the gift of salvation. I don't see anybody wanting to reject, reject the gift of spiritual gifts. How foolish of us would it be to reject his gift of people who God would give to us to help us grow in the Lord? Are you tracking with me? Do you see how this, this is God's word put simply on display? And listen to what it says. These people are given to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And so church, every Christian, according to this passage, this is your third and final point, every Christian is to be engaged in the work of the ministry, building up the church. How many Christians are supposed to be engaged in building up the body and using their gifts? How many? Everyone. All Christians are to be engaged in this. He didn't give these people to the church so that they would just do the work, and he didn't give these people to the church just so a few people would do the work of the ministry. He gave these people to the church, and he gave us our spiritual gifts so that we would all be engaged in the work of the ministry. Every Christian is called to care for and encourage others in spiritual maturity, and it's not me saying that. It's God's word. Listen to this. To equip the saints of the work of the ministry for the building up of the body until we all attain, verse 13, to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. What he's saying is, listen, if you don't have people pouring into your lives and helping you grow, if you're not doing that in other lives, it leaves us open to being led astray. Rather, verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we are, we are, Valley Center Community Church, to grow up in every way into him. We're to grow up into him. What he literally says here is, is that, is that as we develop, we should be looking more and more like Jesus Christ. It's, it's so fascinating. I've seen it in my own life. As I get older, I look more and more like my father in different ways. Fortunately, he gets older, so he looks less and less like me. But well, you know what I'm saying? Like you're just, As you grow, you, you see yourself looking. And who should we be looking like? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. What he's pointing to here is this. We come together, and as we pour into each other's lives, we grow healthily. Spiritually, we grow. Numerically, the church grows because more are brought in. But if we're not pouring into each other's lives, it's to our detriment. It impacts the health of the body. I think about it in this way. Have you ever been to a potluck? Come on, you've been to a potluck before. Everybody brings a dish to share. You know, the only way that a potluck is a good pot, that is a healthy potluck, by the way. Yeah. The only way that a potluck is a good potluck is if there's enough food for everybody there. But in order for there to be enough food for everybody there, everybody's got to bring something. When I was in college, we were having this one party as part of our ministry, and, and the person that was hosting the party, they said, we're going to do a potluck, and, and it was with a bunch of college students. Do, do you see a problem with a potluck with a bunch of college students, right? One, we didn't have a lot to bring to the table, no pun intended, right? And, and, and so the wisdom behind the person that was leading it was that ultimately they understood 
that the potluck would probably be lacking with a bunch of college students bringing something. So, so they provided a bunch of extra, and we were good. But if it had just been left up to us, like, there probably wouldn't have been enough for everybody. But that's not the case with the church. In fact, all of us has abundance because we all have what Christ has provided for us. And he says the church is the healthiest when the church is the place where people are giving and receiving. And that we all bring something to the table. That's why every Christian is to be engaged in the work of the ministry, building up the body of Christ. Listen to me. God's word says that in the church there are no spectators. We're all participants. We're all participants. Can I get an amen to that? This isn't just sitting there and you're just receiving, 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 receiving. This is about us receiving and giving and receiving and giving. We are all participants in this thing. That's why we talk about gathering and growing and giving and going. Because God has made us the people who do this. He has gifted us for this very thing. And it's not just the individual responsibility of the church leaders to do this. All of us have to be bought in on it. And you know one of the blessings of the Valley Center Community Church? See, a lot of people don't know this. I, I don't think they, they know this. When we look at the membership of our church and we look at who you are, the vast majority of people at Valley Center Community Church are engaged in serving in some way, shape, or form. But you know, the amazing thing is that to use your spiritual gift, you don't have to be a part of just one like program in the church. Spiritual gifts are to be used in the one-to-one, day-to-day life that you have been called to live. You don't need a program in the church to validate your gift and what God is wanting to do through you. It starts within the home. It expands to the people around you, the friendships that you know. The question to ask is just a simple question. Who is it that, that God, you have put before me that I need to be pouring into? And some of you are like, oh, I'm not, you don't know me. Like, I, I, I don't know enough of God's word to really be helping someone grow in the Lord, to which I say, wonderful. C.2, God gives gifts to people to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So if you feel inadequate, number one, you're not really, but if you do, then are you asking for help to grow, to be built up in Christ so that you can pour into others? But I would also venture to say that in your spiritual journey, you're some measure further along than somebody else. Maybe you're like three months ahead of somebody in your Bible reading plan. (laughs) They're like, I've never read Job. It's like, I have. Let me tell you about what I learned. Like, we think sometimes that we're limited in what we can do in each other's lives. There are people here at Valley Center Community Church. There are people in your sphere, maybe even it's your own children, that need help to, to grow into Christ that you can pour into. And where you see your own inadequacies, then that's where the Bible says, well, look to those who would then pour into you, giving and receiving, giving and receiving. This is how the church builds itself up. Because there's four quick things that we know this looks like. Number one, it's imparting knowledge of God to one another. That's what this text says. So that we're not tossed to and fro. To, to build up the body of Christ. You're like, Dave, what does it look like for me to, to use my gifts and to help others grow? It's imparting knowledge of God to one another. Like I said, you might be further along in your Bible reading plan. Who are you imparting God's word to? Secondly, it's helping others apply the knowledge of God to their lives. It's not just simply saying, here's what God's word says, but, but this is what it looks like to live this out. Let's help each other. Let's live this out. Where are you struggling How is your soul? And and if you're struggling in your walk, here are some things that that God might be calling you to. Here are some things I want you to remind yourself of. It means serving others in the church. Sometimes it's not just simply speaking the words, but it's making yourself available to the needs of others. And the final way that we build one another up is through proclaiming the gospel to the world. It's not just about spiritual growth. This text also indicates there's the body actually growing and getting bigger. That's the last part. And so in order for the body to grow, more people need to hear. And so sometimes building the body up means proclaiming the gospel to the world. Church, this is who we are. And so let me close with these two points. If you hear me say anything today, hear me say this. We are 
to be concerned for and invested in one another's spiritual development and care. Based upon what God's word says, not me, do you believe that to be true? Is this a truth of God's word that you have embraced? Do you believe that those that you are connected to and you will spend eternity with with right now, God has called you to be engaged in their spiritual care? So many times it's like, hey, I'm gonna call up the pastor, I'm gonna call up the connection group leader. Uh, that's, they gotta deal with that. They need to help that person. No, we all do the work of the ministry because to me, one of the most glorious things of all in this passage is this. Each of us is and always will be necessary for this church. Do you know that? If this passage is true, and it is, each of us is today and always will be necessary for this church because you have gifts that God will give and you have people in your life that you'll be able to reach that I won't ever have the opportunity to reach. Do you know how many people I've talked to in my 20 years of ministry that were not changed and impacted in any way, shape, or form by a message on Sunday morning? And I don't, that does not mind me at all uh, because the purpose of here is to simply encourage and to, to equip and to call out. But I can point to even some of you that I'm looking at who have shared with me the testimony of somebody outside of a Sunday morning who is the one who spoke into your life, who came alongside of you and helped you grow. The question is, who is God calling you to be for others? And are you looking and praying for those opportunities? Paul Tripp said it this way. I love what he said here. And I close with this quote. Your life, church, is much bigger than a good job. It's much bigger than an understanding spouse and non-delinquent kids. It's bigger than beautiful gardens, nice vacations, and fashionable clothes. In reality, you are part of something immense, something that began before you were born and will continue after you die. God is rescuing fallen humanity, transporting them into his kingdom, and progressively changing them into his likeness, and he wants you to be a part of it. And I would change that last phrase. I would say, you are a part of it. Isn't that spectacular? This is what Paul is saying to us in his word. May the Lord fill us in such a way by his spirit that we embrace this so fully so that we would have the joy of living as a fully functioning, healthy body in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I think about this passage, and Lord, I, in my heart, I kind of end where I began. It was such a joy to be able to see Cece's face when we opened up that remote control car on Christmas the disappointment when it wasn't functioning the way it was supposed to. But then, Lord, when we were able to put the things back together and to understand, Lord, how it was supposed to function and what was needed, then the joy that came. Oh, Lord, may that joy be ours in abundance as a church as we continue to walk in your design and your plan for us as your people, that we would see each other as absolutely necessary, that we would understand that we are gifted for one another. And that, Lord, where we don't know how to build one another up and how to help one another, that the truth is your perfect design is that then we look to those that would help us and that we look for others who need help themselves and, and that, Lord, this is, this is a perfect thing that you have made and that you have empowered us to do it. And so, Lord, may it be known of us as a church that we are a body that looks to exalt Christ for the strength that you provide. And we pray we ask this in Christ's name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. We're going to celebrate the unity that we have, our connection to one another, because of our connection through Jesus Christ by coming to the Lord's table. So if you're going to help to serve the Lord's Supper this morning, would you come forward at this time? We're going to pass the elements, and then we'll take them together to celebrate what Christ has done. Let's come to the table.